Amen. Wonderful. All right, I'm going to do something that I have never done in a meeting like this. And I am going to give you a test before we get started. (laughs) So, do our uh, ushers have the test? I would like you to pass out these tests and don't start anything until I can give you some instructions. But if you would, go ahead and start passing out these tests right now. This is a... This is what you get for coming to a Bible college. We're giving you a pop quiz. And I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to help you. And I know that when I pass things out at our Bible college, that people quit listening to me and they go to reading and thinking and they lose track. Don't do that. Amen. Amen. You know, we need more people passing out these tests. At the rate we're going, this is going to take forever. (laughs) Praise God. This test is going to need just a little bit of explanation. You know, I don't know if they got the internet uh, working, but if you are watching by the internet, if it is working, then, uh, and it will be taped, so people may be taking this later. I'm going to give all of these questions. And so you could, if you're watching this later, you could be taking this test too. So um, in just a moment, I'll be giving some instruction and going through this. And I think this will help. If you don't have a pen, I think we have some pens. I don't know if we have enough. But you know, I've I've got the questions. There's 10 questions. And then I've got 1 through 10 over to the right. And I want you to grade yourself 1 through 10 on these things. 10 being the best. And if you don't have a pen, you can sit there and poke a hole in that number or something so that you can do this. So there, you don't have to necessarily have a pen to be able to take this. It would help. And let me give a little bit of instruction before we get right into this. Now, I want you to be brutally honest. This is just for you. You aren't going to turn this test in. You're going to keep it. So this is just for you. It's to help you think about some things. I really felt inspired to do this this morning. And I think that this is going to help you to see some things and it will help you to receive from me as I go through teaching. So I want you to be brutally honest. You know, I took this test and I made 88 on my own test. And that was really being generous. I could have been more critical. Uh, I think I still would have passed. But um, I want you to be honest because this is for your benefit to help bring some things out in the open. And so I want you to be honest as you go through this. And I would like to give you just a little bit of explanation as we go through each one of these questions. So what I did, I went through and I took this test and I had uh, four eights, four nines, and two tens. And so what you do, 4 times 8 is 32, 4 times 9 is 36, 2 times 10 is 20, and you just add those up and that will give you your score. It's real simple. There's 10 questions. So if you have uh, if you have 10 ones, then you made 10 on this test. Amen. It's real simple. It's not real difficult. But uh, I think it's important for you to evaluate. Sometimes people... Don't honestly evaluate where they are, and this will help you. So here, so let's start through this, and here's some of the things I want to preface this with. If you've heard me minister before, in our spirit, you're all tens. In the spirit, you're perfect in every single thing that we're going to be talking about. But I'm not talking about your spirit right now. I'm wanting you to talk about how it's gotten out of your spirit and how it's working in your life how you function on a daily basis. Okay? So, don't give me one of these spiritual answers where every one of you are perfect. In your spirit, you're perfect. But in your flesh, you aren't. Amen? So be honest with this. So I've broken it into four categories because the Scripture, when it uses the term salvation, it's talking primarily about forgiveness of sins, healing, deliverance, and prosperity. Jesus died for all of those areas. And so I'm just wanting you to evaluate. On the left-hand side is what Jesus did for you. 
and I've broken it into these four categories, and I've got a few questions under each one. On the right-hand side are these numbers, and I want you to evaluate how what Jesus did for you, how it's manifesting in your body. Okay? Y'all following this? All right, so the first one, under number one, under forgiveness of sins, righteousness. This means right standing with God. How do you perceive your righteousness? In the Spirit, you're perfect, but in, in practice, how do you walk with the Lord in righteousness? Do you believe that He's pleased with you? Are you in right standing with God? Evaluate yourself. And I actually gave myself an aid on this. I'm not trying to get you to do what I'm doing, but I'm just saying that I know that in the Spirit I'm perfect, but you know what? I still deal sometimes with feelings of unworthiness and that I'm not who I'm supposed to be, and it affects me more than it should. Okay? The next one is no condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But you know what? I still deal with feelings of condemnation. Even though I know intellectually that the Word of God has forgiven me and that I should have no condemnation, there are times that I'm tough on myself and I condemn myself. Amen? Anybody else do that? You know, I was visiting with Jim Ertle, and I really believe that this is kind of a default. It's like all of us were programmed to feel condemned. And you may know that God has forgiven you, and it may be information that you have, but how many people walk in that? This is to evaluate how you walk in this righteousness and no condemnation. And then peace. If you're justified by faith, the effect of that should be peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. How many of you really walk in peace, or is your life in turmoil? If you have no peace, you're a one. If you walk in peace and man, you just your life is just peaceful and regardless of what happens, you can maintain your peace, that would be a 10. Then with healing, all of us know that by His stripes we were healed. Psalms 103, He heals all of our sickness and all of our diseases. There's a lot of people that know that, but let me just ask you to be honest. Where do you stand in appropriating that and walking in the healing power of God? I meet Christians all of the time who can quote you the Scriptures and yet they aren't walking in healing. I mean, if anybody gets sick. You know, I just got an email from a woman and uh, she was, I think it was from South Africa, I forget where it was, but she was someplace where I was and I gave an invitation for healing and she was appalled. And she, she says, something is seriously wrong with the body of Christ. Eighty percent of the people were up there for healing. And she says there was people were she says there was more sickness in this meeting with Christians than there is among unbelievers. Something's wrong with this picture. If Jesus died to purchase healing, how are you walking in it? And then what I've written here as an expected end, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven in the King James, it says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Some translations say a hope and a future, and those are great, but I really like this expected end. Because you know what that means? Is that if you are serving the Lord and walking in the Word of God, you don't have to wonder, when I get old, am I going to be decrepit? Am I going to be blind? Am I going to lose my hearing? Am I going to be one of these that I have incontinence and I can't do this? And you know what? You can have an expected end. Moses didn't have as good a covenant as what we've got, and yet he was 120 years old and his eyesight wasn't dim, nor his natural force abated. So how are you believing and projecting for your older age? Are you just already anticipating? Are you already talking about, well, I'm 40, I'm over the hill, and I... Where are you in this? Jesus purchased... Something for you that's better than what Moses had. And his natural force wasn't abated nor his eyesight dim at 120 years old. Where are you in this process? Are you expecting and embracing and receiving the things that go along with old age? You need to rate yourself on that. Deliverance here, this is a part of what the word salvation means. It means deliverance and you're, you're delivered from fear. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, it says the fear of man brings a snare. Where are you in being afraid of people? Are you a people pleaser? Are you constrained 
by things. You know, Dave Hinton was talking about we say, yes, 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 Lord, and then the Lord tells you to go witness and we're afraid of people and how they're going to perceive it. Where are you in the fear of man? Do you stand up at work? Do you stand for moral principles? Or are you afraid of the rejection of people? And also it says in Luke 174, uh, Zacharias was prophesying and he said, Jesus came to deliver us so that we could serve the Lord without fear. Man, fear is the opposite of faith. We aren't supposed to be fearing men. We aren't supposed to be fearing all of the things. When the terrorist strikes happen, there should have been a difference between the way a Christian responds and the way an unbeliever responds. When the flu comes around, are you afraid of the flu? Or do you stand there and say, man, I'm, I've got a covenant. I'm redeemed from that. There ought to, we ought to be free from fear. Uh, the next one is we need to be free from oppression and depression. And you know, when I was doing this today, I looked up the word depression and it's not used in the Bible. And I started doing some research on this and I'm this is preliminary. I'm not sure that I can say this authoritatively, but everything I've found... Did you know the word depression is basically a new word? People didn't even talk about depression. And I looked up the synonyms for depression and none of those are really biblical terms. Did you know that the way that we have embraced depression, we're so in touch with our feelings and we're up and down, that didn't even exist a few generations ago. People were so busy just living and surviving that they didn't have time to indulge their feelings. They just did what they had to do. Man, that would preach. But evaluate yourself. How are you? Are you encouraged or discouraged? Are you always oppressed or depressed? Where do you rate yourself on this scale? And then deliverance from worry. Man, the Scripture says we're supposed to cast all of our care over on the Lord. I saw a little cartoon one time where a guy was sitting up in bed and his eyes were bloodshot. You could tell he had insomnia. He couldn't sleep. And there was, you know how you draw these little uh, things from a person's mouth and you have their words up there? Well, from up above came a voice that says, My child, go ahead and sleep. I'll be up all night anyway. (laughs) I like that. And the Scripture says that, you know, the Lord takes care for us, and so we're supposed to cast our care over on Him. But how do you do with worrying? Are you worried about your finances? Are you worried about your family? Are you worried about your health? Are you worried about your marriage? Are you worried about your job? We're supposed to be free from worry. How's that working? And then in prosperity, it says, Owe no man anything. Romans 13, 8. You know, I had... uh, in our personal life, Jamie and I have our, our home, our cars, everything totally debt-free, half for years, and I could rate it a 10, but in the ministry, we still have some debt. Not a lot, but some, so anyway, I had to decrease that. I'm, I'm shooting for the place where I owe no man anything but to love one another. That's what Jesus provided, and I'm not totally there yet. Couldn't give myself a 10 on that one. And then, like I was teaching during the offering, the next one is you're supposed to be able to abound unto every good work. Are you able to give and be the blessing that you want to be? If you see somebody in need, do you respond by saying, man, I wished I had something to help them with? You know, prosperity isn't defined by how much you have. True prosperity is designed or defined by how much you give and how much you can bless others. And if there's things that you would like to help, if your church has a building program going on and you say, man, I'd like to be able to help them, but I can't, then you aren't prosperous. And I don't care if you live in a million dollar home. If you see other people that are hurting and you wish that you could help them, but you can't, you aren't prosperous. And I don't care if you have a million dollars tied up in the stock market. Prosperity is not defined by what you have, but how much you can give. I could preach on that for a long time. But anyway, evaluate that, and you can figure out your own score. But here's the reason that I wanted you to do this. Again, if you would take, like if you had four fives, just multiply four times five, that's 20, add up all of your others, multiply them, and you add those, those together and you'll come up with where you rate on a scale of uh, up to 100. 
But here's my point for doing that. Look over here in Galatians chapter 5. And let me share a passage of Scripture with you that if you understand this, this would, this would be a radical thing if you can get hold of this during this conference. It could make a huge difference in your life. In Galatians chapter 5, the background of the book of Galatians, Paul ministered to these people. They got radically saved. They were operating in the liberty and in the freedom that was in Christ, but then some of the Jews came who said that Paul's message was incomplete, that you had to also be holy. You had to keep the law, and unless you did certain things, which the main one that they dealt with was circumcision. And unless you were circumcised, God wouldn't answer your prayers. God wouldn't bless you. You couldn't even be a part of the kingdom of God. And boy, Paul ripped these people. This, in my opinion, is Paul's meanest or most blunt um, letter that he ever wrote to anybody. He, he basically skipped all of the introductions. And in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he just started in on these people. I marvel that you are so soon removed from the faith that was delivered unto you. And then he says, if anybody, even an angel, preaches another gospel unto you than that which I have preached, let him be accursed. Man, that's strong. And if you look this word accursed up, if you look at it in some other translations, it means eternally damned. This is, this is probably the worst things that Paul ever said that are recorded in Scripture. And I'm sure people were just so shocked, like he couldn't mean that, that he said it in the next verse. Again, I say unto you, if any man, even an angel from God, preaches another gospel unto you than that which you have not heard, let him be accursed. In other words, he knew that people were going to be shocked thinking he couldn't mean what he said, so he just repeated it and says, I want you to know I meant exactly what I said. Paul would not compromise on this. You know, Paul's the same one who said, I became all things to all people so that I by all means could win some. Paul would become like a Jew to the Jews. He would become like a Gentile to the Gentiles. But boy, when it came to the truths of the gospel, the basic things, these are things you cannot compromise on. And I mean, he refused to compromise on this. And he just... It's like in the book of Galatians, he takes the gloves off and just beats the people brutally like you... Uh, matter of fact, in the third chapter, he says, you foolish Galatians. Some of the translations I read said, you foolish, uh, you idiots is one translation. Another one is, you stupid people. Who has bewitched you? You're deceived. I mean, Paul was just saying things to these people that were... Amazing. So this is the background of all of it. He's made the case for standing in the grace of God and not slipping back into this performance-based relationship with God. And then in chapter 5, he starts off by saying, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know, all of the words in there are really powerful. I'm going to come back to this probably if I can talk fast enough. In verse 2 he says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now Paul himself was circumcised. He said that over in Philippians chapter 3 when he was giving all of his qualifications. So this isn't saying that you couldn't be circumcised. It's saying you can't put any faith in that. It's not your circumcision. Or today, circumcision isn't the thing that people uh, argue for. It's you've got to be holy. And you've got to do this and this and this. And they have a million different requirements. You've got to study the words. You've got to pray. You've got to pay your tithes. You can't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. You've got to do this and this and this. And God is going to answer your prayers based on your performance. That would be the equivalent of what Paul is talking about. It may not be talking about... Circumcision may not be the issue with you, but some churches, you've got to be water baptized in the name of Jesus or you can't have a relationship with God. Other churches, you've got to do different things. It's just... And whether it's a church or not, most of us have this intuitive standard that we have to live up to. We've made a promise that we're going to spend an hour a day praying or we're going to do this or this. And if you don't do it, well then you just... It's not that you doubt that God could do something for you. You just don't believe He will do it because you aren't worthy. 
That's the same thing he's talking about. And if that's the attitude that you have, it says Christ shall profit you nothing. That is one strong statement. In verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. And again, circumcision is not the issue. It's every man who is trusting in your own goodness and having to feel worthy that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And then in verse 4, here's the verse I was wanting to get to, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And this is what prompted me to do this whole thing. I got to thinking about this is, Jesus is the greatest gift that God ever gave the human race. Without a doubt. Jesus is the greatest thing that's ever happened to a single person in here. If you don't know Jesus personally, then it doesn't matter what your accomplishments are. They're nothing. What good would it do you to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? It profits you nothing. Jesus is the focal point of everything, and yet you can completely make what Jesus did of no effect in your life. And most people would think, well, yeah, I, I sinned, and I, I understand that. It didn't say that sin is what causes this. Sin can't make Christ of no effect. Jesus is bigger than any sin that you've ever committed. There is no sin that you have or ever can commit that would make Christ of no effect. He can overcome any sin. It doesn't matter what you've done. You know, there are some of you sitting right there tonight and you're thinking, well, you don't know what I've done. Jesus knows what you've done and there is no sin that is greater than Jesus. Paul even said that he was the worst sinner of all. He even persecuted and killed Christians and yet he says, Jesus, save me and use me as an example to those that would believe afterwards. If, if Paul could be saved, then any of us can be saved. There is nothing, there is no sin in your life that can keep you from being saved and there's also no sin in your life that will make Jesus withdraw from you or hold back. This says that what causes you, what causes Christ to become of no effect is if you are justified by the law. And some of you think, well, I'm not under the law. Again, we use different terminology today, but this just means that if you are thinking that you have to live up to a standard and you have to be holy to a certain degree before God can answer your prayers or love you or use you, then you are under the law. And this is what makes Christ of no effect. So again, look at this little test that we took. And I don't know what your test score on was. And I don't know if you were honest or not. If you weren't honest, you ought to subtract 50 points from your score. <laughs> so it depends whether you were honest and a lot of other things. But you know what? If, if I, My suspicion would be... My suspicion would be that there were some low scores. If you were honest. Let me just go through a couple of things and point, point this out. For instance, the very first thing, forgiveness of sin, understanding that you are in right standing with God. Did you know it says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, that the wicked flee when there's no man without, but the righteous are bold as a lion. So just evaluate. Are you bold as a lion? Not only in spiritual things, but just in everything. Are you bold? Are you one of these people that's just afraid? You, you know, it's like when you bend over and you pet a dog. If every time you do that, it bites you. After a while, you just don't pet that dog very much. Amen. <laughs> or you, you just stay away from it. There are some of you that honestly avoid all kinds of situations because the truth is you do not know and fully understand and walk in the righteousness of God believing that God is with you and that God's pleased with you. Your, your, your whole life is based on performance. And because you haven't performed well in some area, 
Many of you don't ever exert yourself. You don't ever put yourself in a situation where you could fail because you're insecure. And you could, dis- you could discuss this in a lot of different ways, but uh, the way I would say is that, you know what, you don't understand righteousness. You don't understand who you are. You don't understand your position and your relationship to God. And that's what causes insecurity. I know many of you aren't agreeing with me on this, and you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. I'm telling you, this is true. I was an introvert. You know, I could not have done this. Before Jesus showed these things to me, this would have been the worst thing in my entire life. I think, Arthur, weren't you, uh, what was it, dyslexic? And because of it, he had all kinds of insecurities in his life and stuff. I can tell you, this is absolutely impossible for me to do in the natural. And you know what set me free? is when I understood who I was in Christ. And I'm going to say something. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just drop this. And you, uh, I've got a teaching on self-centeredness, the root of all grief. If you don't believe it, go get that little booklet or tape and listen to it. And I guarantee you, it'll open up your eyes. But the root of all shyness and timidness and insecurity is just... Self-centered, you're thinking about yourself. You're afraid of the rejection of people. Some of you think, well, no, it's my personality and this is the way that I was made. God never made an introvert. God never made an insecure person. That's a part of your acquired uh, personality. It's things that can change. I'm living proof of it. And it's because you don't understand who you are. When I found out that God Almighty loved me. And I mean, I knew. It wasn't just something that I had heard or theory, but I experienced God's love. I was caught up in the presence of God for four and a half months. I know that God loves me. And once I knew that, and once I became aware of my right standing, my righteous position in the Lord, I lost my fear of man. I, I still deal with it to a degree, but I'm saying... 90-something percent of my fear of man was just gone because if God Almighty loved me, who gives a rip about anybody else? And there are some of you that are insecure because you've been rejected and criticized, some of it justly. But you're insecure and the reason you don't exert yourself, the reason you don't try and become the CEO of the company is because you're just afraid that you can't do it. You're insecure. And you know, the antidote for that is righteousness. The righteous are bold as a lion. And once I found out who I was in Christ and that God was on my side, it's still true that I'm not supposed to try and do everything. Not everything that's good is God. I need to limit myself to what God wants me to do. But I'm saying if I feel that God wants me to do it, I'd go do anything. And some of you think, yeah, it's easier to say. But you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we've just bought a piece of property and I've got to have at least $30 million or $40 million to develop it. Plus, we've been believing to go on TBN, which we just got accepted last week. We will be starting a daily broadcast on TBN. And the airtime for TBN plus the employees I'll have to hire to do this plus the materials we'll send out free which over 50% of the people that contact us don't send a thing. And we send them all the materials free. By the time you figure all this up, I'm going to have to add $400,000 per month to my expenses February the 7th. Which is just a short period of time from now. And so I've got this half a million dollars that I need per month increase plus $30 million minimum, maybe $40 million in the next two years and all of these things collided to make the perfect blessing. Amen. And I can just guarantee you this, I couldn't have done this back in the beginning. But now that I know my right standing with God and I believe that God has led me in all of this, I believe I can do what God calls me to do. And I'm in the process of living it and walking it out. So you can sit there and disagree with me and say it's easier to preach than it is to live, but I'm walking it out too. It's not just theory with me. 
And there are some of you that you have opportunities and yet you're afraid to step out because you don't understand righteousness. That's what I mean when I'm talking about when the righteous are bold as a lion. When you understand who you are in Christ, it changes everything. Nobody can manipulate you. Nobody can intimidate you. Because, I mean, if God Almighty loves me, it just doesn't matter that much what you think. I've had people come to me and ream me out and do things, and I've stopped them right in the middle, and I said, hey, wait, uh, who died and made you God? <laughs> and I've had people stop them and say, what do you mean? I said, you know what, I don't know who you are. Why do I care what you think? Oh, well, you're supposed to care, and, and they start, and I say, you know what, compared to God, you're nothing. And that's not that I don't love other people and esteem them, but I'm saying that you know why many of us are intimidated and back off and do the things that we do is because you don't know who you are in Christ. You don't understand your righteous position with Him. And it, and it comes back to this thing, that you, are not, you aren't under grace. You're falling from grace, but you're under law. You are thinking that your right standing with God is dependent upon how you act. And it's not. I couldn't tell you the number of churches I've been in. Any of these ministers, I can guarantee you, they have heard people pray and say, Oh God, make me righteous. You get born again righteous. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 says, Put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You don't grow into righteousness and holiness. You get born again righteous and holy in your spirit. Now, it's true that your actions may get more and more in line with God, but the truth is that in the Spirit, you are the righteousness of God the moment you are born again, and you aren't in the process of becoming righteous. You were born that way. And if you aren't enjoying the benefits of righteousness, it's not because you aren't worthy. In your spirit, you were created that way. It's just because you don't have a renewed mind. It's like the Scripture says, you aren't walking in grace but you're under the law. You are under this mentality of thinking, I've got to do these things before God will be pleased with me. You know, most of us have somebody who nags us. Of course, it's not our wives. But there's always somebody. I mean, the devil has plenty of people out there that he can just send them across your path and he knows what your weakness is and somebody will criticize you over something. We have plenty of people criticizing us and if other people don't do it, most of us do a bang-up job of doing it ourselves. Most people have been raised to be goal-oriented and so you set all of these goals and you set goals that many times are way beyond you and we think that that's positive and motivating us and yet the Scripture says in Proverbs 13 verse 12, I believe it is, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. The moment you start setting goals and say, this is what I'm going to do. You know, a New Year's resolution. I'm going to lose 50 pounds or whatever. It can motivate you, yes, but you also were running a huge potential of disappointment and then condemnation when you fall short of that standard. And most of us have been taught that this is the way that we're supposed to motivate ourselves is to set all of these goals. And many of you in here have all kinds of goals that you have set that you have failed, that you've broken, and you may not consciously sit down and just evaluate yourself, but the truth is, it's like you have a checklist, and most of us are failing our own standards. And you are bearing a constant sense of unworthiness, which relates to that second question about condemnation. You just constantly are feeling unfit for use. God, I failed again. God, I promised I was going to spend more time with my wife. I promised I was going to remember her anniversary. I promised I was going to remember her birthday this year. I promised that I'm going to do this. And you just fail and fail. And whether you sit there and consciously think about it, you just embrace this sense of failure and this sense of, man, God, I'm just so far short. You're displeased with yourself. With many of us, we can't even blame it on the devil. I believe that sometimes the devil looks at the way we condemn ourselves and beat ourselves up and he takes notes like, man, I never thought of that one. 
He's probably been learning from us. With many of us, the devil could go on vacation and leave us alone. We're doing a wonderful job of destroying ourselves. And you know what? I'm not trying to criticize you because on this thing, I think I scored myself as an 8. And I know these things I'm preaching. But you know what? Again, I have. it's like gravity. You can overcome gravity with the law of thrust and lift, aerodynamics. And you can fly. But did you know what? Gravity never ceases. It's always there. And you turn off those engines and see if gravity is still there. And you know what? I have to constantly, like it says here in the first part of this chapter, stand fast in the liberty. The word stand fast is talking about, it's an active word that you have to pursue this. You have to fight. You have to persevere. In other words, this isn't something that just works automatically. You have to stand fast in these truths. And there are times that sometimes I'll go to coasting. And I'm not seeking the Lord the way that I should. And I get to goofing off and doing stuff. And you know what? I, it's just like the moment you turn off the engine, gravity's there. The moment I quit building myself up and speaking to myself who I am in Christ and going back over the things of God, I have a tendency towards condemnation. I was talking to Jim today and, you know, we are just being honest. We both took this test before we came in here and we were talking about it. And Jim was surprised. And he says, you mean you deal with condemnation? I said, man, there's, I guarantee you, I could be really, really hard on myself. I can sit there and condemn myself and think, man, I could have done better than that. I believe that most people do. And you know why that is? It says the reason Christ becomes of no effect. He provided righteousness for us and no condemnation. You know the reason that most people don't walk in that? Because you are seeking to be right with God through your own effort instead of recognizing that the relationship with God is 100% dependent upon what Jesus did for us and not what we do for Him. We aren't under grace, we're under law. That's what makes Christ of none effect. That's what makes righteousness of none effect. That's what makes no condemnation of none effect. And that we are walking in condemnation is because we aren't walking in the grace of God. We've fallen back into law. Many of us, when I talk about law, we're thinking about offering blood sacrifices and observing the... Feast of Passovers and Feast of Tabernacles, and that's what we think of as law. But law is anything that you have to do to make God love you or accept you or be pleased with you. Anything that you have written down that you have to do this before God will accept you or bless you or use you or anoint you is law. Thank you for those two head shakes. Some of you are thinking about this. Think about, but there are things I've got to do. There's lots of things we need to do, but it's for us. Living holy, studying the Word, and doing all of these things changes your heart towards God. But it doesn't change God's heart towards you. God loves you completely separate. I mean, there's not even a connection here. It is absolutely, completely separate from your performance. Your worth in the eyes of God is not based on what you do. It is based on whether or not you've accepted Jesus. And if you accept Jesus, then all of His righteousness gets imputed unto your account. In the Spirit, you are as righteous and holy and pure as what Jesus is. And God is a Spirit, John 4, 24. And He looks at you in the Spirit. And God is pleased with you because of your holiness and righteousness that was given you through Christ, not through your performance. And I tell you, this is good for anybody. If there's women watching, if there's kids watching, and what other category there is, I can't think of any. This is good for anybody. But did you know what? Guys especially. Most guys define who they are by what they do. If you ask, you know, a guy, who are you? They're going to tell you pretty much, well, here's what I do for a living. This is what I do. And they define who they are by all of the things that they do. And even though those things are an indication and a reflection of who you are, what you do 
is not who you are. And that's, that's a powerful piece of information right there. This is why so many ministers wind up committing adultery and stealing money and doing things. And it's because they get to thinking there's somebody because look what I've done. And they, they don't have their own personal identity and relationship with the Lord and they get to basing it on performance. I tell you, it's not about what I do. It's like Jesus was talking to Mary and Martha. Martha was doing all of this stuff. And Martha got mad at Mary because all she was doing was sitting and listening to Jesus teach. And she says, Jesus, tell Mary that she has to help me serve and do all of these things. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are troubled about all of these things, but only one thing is needful. And Mary chose the good part, the better part. that won't be taken away. You know what's important? It is important if you have guests over that you treat them right and do things, but that's not the heart of it. It's, it's relationship. God is more concerned about you and having relationship with you than He is about all of the things that you do. The Lord does not define you based on all of the things that you do. There are some of you that are super successful and yet you're doing it, you're driving yourself trying to earn somebody's acceptance or trying to prove yourself to somebody who said you would never amount to anything or whatever, and in, the, in your heart, you aren't successful. You understand what I'm saying? There's some of you that may have trophies, and you may have lots of money, and you may have awards, and yet you're a mess. And there's some of you that have done everything wrong, And yet God doesn't see you as a mess because He looks on your heart. You need to, men especially need to get rid of this mindset of it all being about what I do. The Scripture says in many places, but one of them that's real clear is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. And it says, If I give all of my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, and yet don't do it by love, motivated by God's kind of love, charity. It profits me nothing. The motive behind your action is more important than your action. If you're doing things motivated out of fear, out of rage, out of jealousy, out of all of these other things, it can undo, as far as your benefit, you might be able to bless somebody else, but as far as your benefit, it undoes the good that you do if you do it with the wrong motive. And so it's a matter of the heart. It's all about relationship. Jesus died to make us righteous. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For He, God, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, that we... I mean, who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. It's an exchange. It's a swap. We were sinners. Jesus was righteous. And yet God made Jesus to become a sinner so that we could become righteous. Jesus took all of our sin and gave us all of His righteousness. You are righteous through what Jesus did, not through what you do. And if you could ever understand that and quit basing your relationship with God on what you do and instead put faith in what Jesus did for you, you would find out that you would experience righteousness and all of the benefits that go with it. You would be bold as a lion. You would not be condemned. Amen? And you would have peace. Wasn't that the next one? Peace. Peace is a result of righteousness. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 14, I think it's verse 13, or 13, 14, somewhere around there. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy. Understanding your right position with God and having peace. It says in Romans 5, 1, being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace is a result of having a right relationship with God. 
And brothers, I'm not saying this to hurt anybody or criticize. I'm trying to open up our eyes because many of us are just thinking that, oh, you know, everybody's the same way that I am. Well, they may be, but that's not the way that God made it to be. Jesus produced peace. He says, My peace give I unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If you were to diagram that sentence, you would have to say, You let not your heart be troubled. It's not up to God. There's some of you in here that just have no peace. You're worried and fretful about everything. And man, your whole life is in turmoil and you would not characterize yourself as a peaceful person. And yet you're praying and saying, Oh God, please just give me peace. It says, You let not your heart be troubled. You're the one that has to appropriate this. Galatians 5.22 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Peace is something that the Holy Spirit put on the inside of you. In your born-again spirit, you have perfect peace. Perfect peace. But you have to keep your mind stayed upon Him for that perfect peace to operate. Isaiah chapter 26. We just haven't let the peace of God rule in our heart. Instead, we're watching... If you're watching the news and reading all of the things that are going on in the world, you aren't going to have peace. And let me just add a little P.S. some of you. Amen to that. But you know what? If you're listening to all of the conservative talk show hosts, you aren't going to have peace. And that's not to say that there isn't a place for that because our news media isn't telling us the truth and we have to have an alternate source to be able to get some news from. But I guarantee you, they don't tell you the good stuff that's happening. They are majoring on everything bad and amplifying it and criticizing every single thing. I just read...
got an email before I walked in here. And a woman was writing about how that she had been listening to all of the things that are happening in our nation and all of this. And she was so disturbed that she was getting angry. She was taking it out when she drove. She had this rage on the inside of her. She was taking it out on her family, people at work, and it had finally gotten so bad that she had gotten criticized for it and punished by some people at work and other things. And it just got so bad that finally she came to the end of herself and says, God, I'm sorry. I have let the things that are going on in this world just defeat me and depress me and make me angry. And she just fell on her face and repented and asked God to forgive her, fell asleep praying. She woke up to my television program and I was teaching on the war is over. God's not mad at you. And she was telling me all of this to say that, man, that was the word that I needed that God had forgiven me and accepted this. But, you know, I agree with her that if all you do is look at the way things are going in this world, I saw a bumper sticker that says, if you aren't angry or frustrated, you aren't paying attention. And that's true if you don't factor Jesus into it. If you're just looking at things in the natural, and if what's going on in our world isn't bothering you, you aren't paying attention. Something's wrong with you because the world is going to hell. The world is moving in a bad direction. Things are getting worse. Things aren't getting better. And you know what? If that's what you're doing, there is no peace in this world. Man, there's just mayhem. There's terrible things going on. The only way you can have peace, Isaiah 26, 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. If you don't have peace, it's because your mind isn't focused on God. You aren't truly seeking God. You're too plugged into the world. And you are trying to perform and get everything from God based on your performance. And if you are basing God's uh, move in your life based on your performance, there will be no peace. Even if you do great today, if you fasted today, if you prayed today, and if everything was perfect today, there will be no peace because tomorrow is a new day and you could blow it tomorrow. There is no rest when you are the one that has to please God and make God move because of what you're doing. There is no peace. There's no rest to that. Man, I don't know if I'm getting this across to you, but these are important things that I'm saying. You know, I, don't, I didn't grade myself a number 10 on this piece. Or maybe I did. Maybe that's one of the ones I gave myself a 10 on. No, I gave myself a 9. You know, I haven't arrived, but I've left. But I can tell you, peace is one of the strong points in my life. And it comes back to all of these things that we're talking about. that I, It's like having a safety net under you. If you're walking on a high wire, you know what, if you have no safety net, there is no peace.
if you have a safety net, you may still be trying to perform and not fall, but you don't have the same fear, the same worry, the same concern and care because you know that if you fall, no big deal, you're going to be caught. When you know that God loves you and you have a revelation of righteousness and you know that there's no condemnation, that God is not going to judge you. He's not going to reject you. God is not mad at you. He's not even in a bad mood. And He's not ever going to get in a bad mood. When you truly understand that, it just gives you a sense of peace that you cannot get when you are trying to do everything to please God. Brothers, you are not going to be perfect. Some of you may have come here thinking that, man, I'm going to get straightened out and go out of here and praise God, I'm never going to have another mistake in my life. Not going to happen. The only way we can get you perfect is to get you totally repented and up to speed and walking in love and then just kill you. And that's the only way you're going to leave this place and be perfect. You are going to fail. It doesn't mean that you have to go commit adultery. It doesn't mean you have to lie and steal. It doesn't mean you have to do dope. But you will fail to be the person that you're supposed to be. You can improve yourself. You can start getting on the winning side to where you have more victories than you have failures. But you are human and you are not going to be perfect. And as long as you are basing everything on, I've got to do this perfectly and I've got to please God, as long as you're a perfectionist mentality, you will have no peace. It only comes in understanding that God didn't choose you because you were worthy to be chosen. He said this many times in Scriptures. He says to the Israelites, He says, don't think that I chose you because you were the biggest or the best. He says, you were nothing. He says, your father in, in Ur of the Chaldees was an idol worshiper. I didn't choose you because you deserved it. It says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham found the grace of God. Abraham wasn't a perfect guy. Abraham was willing to let a pagan king take his wife and commit adultery with her. And he didn't do it once. He did it twice. Abraham did some... He had some serious things wrong with him. It's amazing how the Lord reveals all of these flaws of people, shows us that David committed adultery and murdered to cover up his adultery. And you go on and on. Noah got stoned drunk and was naked in his tent and... You go through all of the great leaders and God just reveals every wart, everything wrong with them. And yet somehow or another we think, well, you've got to be perfect to have God use you. God's never had anybody qualified working for Him yet. God does not use you because you deserve to be used. He doesn't use you because you're usable. He uses you because He is love. And it's grace. See, this is what Paul was talking about. If you aren't receiving the effects of Christ in your life, if Christ has become of no effect in this area of righteousness and of no condemnation and of peace, it's because you are under the deception of thinking it's all based on how worthy you are and how holy you live. And that's the reason that Christ isn't what He purchased. And most of us know that we're supposed to be righteous. Most of us know that we're supposed to have no condemnation. Most of us know we're supposed to walk in peace. But if you were honest, I bet you not very many people came out very well on this. And you know why? It's because we have been seeking to be justified by the law. We have been trying to earn God's favor. I can tell you that the, still the condemnation that I deal with is because I get to thinking I could have done better. Chỉ cần ngày vẫn nắng lên đèn phải buộc được sáng tên là cuộc đời của ta cứ trôi như êm đềm. 
chỉ cần ngồi vào nắng lên đem về bụng sáng tên là cuộc đời của ta sống trong mini game mình nhảy múa trong phòng toàn hơi men cùng đất trời trong đi ở nhà cũ mẹ ngồi cùng đưa nhau sang paris để người trai tim ta thân thi là những điều mà ta muốn khi nhà chính thì ta xuống ôm cả lưng chạy đến nơi đây vẫn còn suy đừng mơ đến được với nhiều hồng màu bất chế độ yêu anh như tình yêu màu hồng